music. All right, good morning, guys. We're going to start the next session here in just a minute. So if you guys want to make your way back over, uh, we're going to be keep moving on. I hope you guys, how's everyone doing? Yeah, that's good. Right, make sure you guys get a drink, stay hydrated, you know. Uh, this is important that we stay hydrated. My name is Ryan Fennell. I'm one of the co-founders here at B-Sides. So glad for everyone that has come, traveled. I hope you guys are enjoying the sessions. Um, our next speaker here is Matt Hansen, and he's presenting on uh, Beyond No, InfoSec's role in enterprise success. Matt is a cloud solution architect at Microsoft who is focus, uh, focuses on Azure infrastructure and security. He's been in the industry for 15 years as an engineer uh, and architect. He serves as a subject matter expert, uh, advisor, committee member, and as a professor at Cloud Security Technologies. Uh, Matt holds over 50 industry certifications, such as the CCSP, the CISSP, Azure Security Engineer, Azure Network Engineer, and has all, all versions, basically everything Azure. That's what I'm reading. Uh, Matt holds a BS in Network Engineering and an MS in Engineering Management and an MS in Information System Security and an Executive C Certificate in Cybersecurity Management. He really knows Azure. Azure. And actually, I was I was hitting him up earlier about Azure stuff too. So I was like, "Hey, can you help me with this?" So, with uh, without further ado, we'll, uh, go ahead and uh, have Matt come on up. Give him a warm welcome. Yep. Okay. Ooh, the mic's good. That's all right. So here we go. The first one after the keynote. That's not uh, terrifying at all in this giant, beautiful room. So my name is Matt Hansen, like Ryan said. I'm gonna be talking today on Beyond No, Information Security's role in enterprise success. And I got a wireless, uh, or I got a surface charger here so I can turn up my brightness on my screen, which is super helpful. Appreciate it, Miles. All right. <laughs> this is the radical shift to wake you up for going from black screen to white screen, all right? Um, so quick about me, Ryan already did a great job, but I'm Matt, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I've been in the industry for a while, and the reason why I do this about me is because I'm going to talk about how we should be thinking about our security programs. So I want to make sure that you at least think I kind of know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm a principal cloud technologist at Microsoft for the Health and Life Sciences um, vertical, working with primarily Fortune 100s. Um, and I spent, up until six months ago, spent my entire time at Microsoft as a cloud program architect, so building um, cloud programs and security programs for Fortune 100 companies. I'm also a professor and a coach of cybersecurity at Indiana Tech. I got representation here in the middle of the room, a whole bunch of students. Um, and a cybersecurity advisor on Governor Holcomb's Indie Executive Council on Cybersecurity, also at uh, ICS Squared. And then recently founder of uh, CyberBridge Indiana, which is a, a nonprofit geared towards pairing up new in career and career transitioning individuals with other nonprofits that can't afford to hire uh, cybersecurity people. A couple certs, three and a half degrees in a bonus round, um, dropped out of a PhD and did a little executive certificate. So I think that's the, uh, the interesting part of that. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of story time. And I just realized, so this is gonna be an inter interesting talk. I put all my speaker notes one slide early, so I gotta memorize it before I go to the next slide, so this will be fun. Um, so a number of years ago, I was a bright-eyed information security engineer sitting in a room being called in as a consultant for a team that was gonna deploy a workload at a company I used to work for. So we're sitting around this table, and they're saying, hey, we've got this thing that we've designed, and we need your sign off, because this is the way the company works. Security comes in, we sign off on stuff, and then we are able to uh, move on with it. So they're explaining this to me, and we've got the whiteboard going. They say, we're gonna put uh, Windows RDS, Remote Desktop Services, uh, in Azure. It's gonna be uh, one of our first cloud workloads. This was a long time ago, by the way. Um, we didn't really want to have to involve security, so we did as much as we could on our own, and we're just gonna tell you sort of how it is. I said, great, let's see what it looks like. They said, we're gonna have RDS up in Azure, sounds good. Um, we don't have a firewall person, so we're just gonna put the RDS gateway on a public IP, but we're gonna use a Windows firewall, so it's good enough. I said, okay, um, let's see what else you got. Um, then we're just gonna have a session host right behind that, and then right behind that is, um, PII that we are responsible for, for our clients. Um, so it's just a, a one hop to the PII, but we have Windows Firewall, so we should be good. 
Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. So let's keep going. What else you got? They said, but we want single sign-on, so we're going to use Radius. Okay, cool. Great. I love it. I love it. Um, that Radius needs to talk to Active Directory, and security said we can't put Active Directory in the cloud yet. So it's going to be on-prem. Um, we're just going to open up a tiny little firewall hole, um, but we're only going to give it access to the IP of the Radius server in Azure. So that's going to have a public IP. We're going to give our domain controller public IP. And then they're going to talk, and Kerberos won't fail, and it'll be great. No. No. <laughs> I said no. And I love this chat GPT image, by the way. I tried so many different prompts to make it look like me. I came out a little bit more Amish than I was expecting, but <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Um, and they said, OK, well, we, we really need this to work. This is important for our business. Um, so what if we, nope. Well, how about if we, no. OK, so hear me out. No, I am not hearing you out. And after a little while, um, I had who was at the time a, my, a skip level manager in another organization said something to me that I think was really interesting. Um, he screamed at me. I could pay a janitor to tell me no. Why are you even here? And I thought, huh, that's a good point. Why am I here? Um, one of the things that I forgot to point out because my speaker notes are messed up on the original slide was uh, my first job ever was a janitor at a gym. And uh, so that kind of resonated with me a little bit. And I've had multiple additional conversations throughout my career with developers, with managers. Um, coming to Microsoft, I had a manager who was a hardcore developer, always a developer, hated and still hates security. Um, and so that was, I had a lot of interesting conversations with him. And at a certain point, it was about 2019 or so, I did a version of this talk for Cloud Security Alliance and I thought, why, why am I here? Why am I in a role of security? Am I just locking doors? Or am I doing anything that's actually valuable? Why is the organization paying me? Why does your organization pay anybody in information security? So question number one. I'm going to have three questions here going out throughout this presentation. Why do we have jobs in InfoSec? Do we contribute to the success of the business? If you think about where InfoSec is aligned in the organization's they're aligned with everybody else that provides significant value to progress the purpose and progress the mission of the organization. But if InfoSec or CyberSec or however you define security in your organization is just there to close doors and say no, that's not really providing value. We're still acting in a way that allows the business to continue, but are we actually providing value? So then about a year after that, 2020, I started looking into some ISC squared certifications. And I thought this was interesting. In the exam outline, there's a section 1.3. We're only two, two lines into the exam outline. Um, one of the things that we're taught in the CISSP is the alignment of security to the business strategy, goals, missions, and objectives. This does not say, tell the business no unless they're secure. It says, align to the business strategy and the goals and missions of the organization. Also, in 1.6, align the security function to the business strategy, goals and missions, and, ob and objectives. This is pervasive throughout the CISSP, and I thought that was really interesting. The sort of face of information security certifications, which I'm not here to argue at this point, we can talk about that later, um, is presenting security in a way that needs to provide value to the organization. So why do we have a security team in the first place? <clears throat> this is my perspective. I think we have a security team to enable the business goals of the organization um, to become as frictionless as possible to move forward and do what they need to do to make money. Um, also reduce risk, add assurances across everything else, but that's secondary. Reducing risk is secondary to enablement. That should always be first priority. The business's goal is not to be PCI DSS compliant. As much as we like to think it is, or have patched systems, that is not the goal of the business. The CEO is not saying, 
by Friday, I want to tell all my shareholders that we're going to make more money because we patched our Windows servers. That's, that's not the goal of the business. Now, to serve their purpose of, the, of whatever the mission of the organization is, we need to be compliant. They need to be able to move forward, not have breaches that are game stoppers. So we're reducing risk in a way that allows the business to still serve their purpose. And I took these two points from Mark Simos. I'm switching back and forth between black screen and white screen. You see that? I'm keeping you all awake. It's a dark room. Um, I took these anti-patterns from Mark Simos, who is the chief cybersecurity architect at Microsoft and created the Microsoft reference or security architecture references, if you've ever seen those. The anti-pattern is misassigning accountability. The way we should be thinking about security teams is that the asset owners should be accountable for the risk that they accept. But the security team should be responsible for informing the asset owners of those risks. This is working together. This is saying, okay, here's the risk that we've identified. We've identified a risk that you want to put our domain controller on the internet. Let's go through the process of working together to accept, avoid, mitigate, transfer those risks. You can accept those, but I'm going to inform you, and we're going to create a register that says this is why we did what we did with these risks, and this is our after-action plan. So another section <clears throat> that I took from Mark Simos is actually the 10 Laws of Cybersecurity Risk. And I want to look at a couple of these. Productivity always wins. So security isn't easy for users, right? Whether that is an end user, um, whether, that, whether that's a developer that just wants to get their code pushed, they're not trying to be intentionally malicious, they're not trying to intentionally get around something, but they want to be productive. We've all heard this before. Security is a team sport, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Technology doesn't solve the people and process problems. We can put in all the logging mechanisms, all the seams, all the patch servers, all whatever we want in, but we're still not going to solve a cultural problem of the original story of that team not wanting to involve security because they were so challenging to work with. Unless we address that, we're not going to work together to increase the security baseline of the organization. So we've all seen this before, right? Cybersecurity is a team sport. It took about two minutes on Bing Images, not Google Images, Bing Images, by the way, um, <clears throat> to find an entire slide full of this. Cybersecurity is a team sport. It's all over the place. So here's a little bit of audience participation. If nobody answers, I'll force one of my students to do it. Um, what, is that, what do you think of when you see cybersecurity is a team sport? What's, what's an example of that? All right, somebody from the table here. <clears throat> Miles, how about you, buddy? Well, cybersecurity is a team sport. What does that mean? What's an example of that? It's what? Com oh, competitive cybersecurity. <laughs> what a plug. Um, so typically, we think about this in a way that the users are doing their part, right? They're helping the security teams. And that's true. You know, we talk about all the time how the, the human element of security is the most challenging part to solve for. But question number two I have is, am I or is the security organization a part of that team? If cybersecurity is a team sport, are we a part of that team that's making the security program successful, or do we just play the role of enforcer? Are we a part of that team, or are we telling people what to do? If you're telling people what to do, they typically don't want to work with you as much. And that's not going to be good for the culture. I had to sneak in a few memes here and there. Um, but, working up to my next point, to be a part of that team, once you sort of get, become a part of that team, you're starting to work together. One of the biggest issues that we have in cybersecurity is visibility, right? Um, and we're gonna move on here, as John Cena says, we wanna make sure that, uh, don't let your asset visibility look like me, John Cena, probably because um, you can't see him, in case you didn't catch that. Um, so, we're going to move on to the next part here. Um, insubordination lurks in the shadows. Think about the original story. What if that team hadn't come to security, and they just wanted to sort of do what they do on their own? 
created some cloud workloads. It doesn't have to be cloud. It can be anywhere, wherever they have the ability to create those things. Um, purchasing cloud services or other services on their personal credit cards instead of going through purchasing, which will typically trigger a conversation with security, right? Every, anything to do, anything to increase their productivity, they're going to do. Remember the cybersecurity law number six, productivity always wins. They're gonna do what they can to be productive. Using non-standard productivity apps. Um, if you use a certain chat application at uh, your organization, and the DLP package add-on happens to be super expensive. You know, maybe they're gonna be, those users are gonna find something else to get their work done. Work through Discord or um, use personal emails or something like that. Easier file sharing tools. This is terrible. Just, we, John before was talking about DLP, right? Um, incredibly challenging to get around these things. Users are not, trying to, non-security individuals are not trying to cause risk to the organization. They're trying to be productive. So when we look at what some security organizations, and I won't call out who this was, um, say we should do with shadow IT, find them, beat them, lock them in a cage, and fire them, basically, right? Like, we, we want to beat them into submission. Whack-a-mole is an endless game. We need to focus the time and energy on fulfilling the needs of the employees. And by being an ally and not an enforcer, we can work together. If they know that you're working with them, if the developers know, if the sysadmins know, if, you know, I don't know how your, your, your organizations are structured. Um, but whomever needs to work with the security team or the security organization knows that you're an ally and that you're going to help them because they don't want to be non-compliant. They're going to get in trouble for that, but they're just trying to get their job done. If they know you're an ally, they're going to work together with you. So question number three. Am I considered not only a security expert, but also a trusted advisor that works to support those asset owners? If you're not, consider how you are perceived by the rest of the organization. Do they want to work with you? Do they want to work with your organization? Are they gonna try to create, are they gonna spend all this time coming up with this, what was probably a fairly challenging to get around this, this typical security structures, architecture, to put a firewall hole to the public internet, to your domain controller, um, to figure out how to get RDS and RADIUS to work, which in and of itself is incredibly challenging. Um, they spent all this time without security just to get to the point to be told no again. We're breaking that cycle by becoming an ally. There's a double negative there of time lost not working with security, then time lost being told no, and then are alternatives even offered? Or is it just the stamp of no? Most people are good, and they're not going to want to, as one of my developer colleagues said, um, break into the building at night, turn on all the lights, and leave. Um, this was said more in the context of cloud spend, not necessarily security, but I think it plays well here as well. They're not trying to make the organization have a higher risk profile. They're not trying to get in trouble. They just want to get their work done. I've said that enough times that I think it should be sinking in, right? So here we go. <clears throat> as the reflection of these topics, how can I, as an InfoSec professional, add positive value? And I think it's something that we could all reflect on. And even if you're not, if your role isn't specific to security, if you're only part-time security, or if you play the role of security advisor within your department or within your organization, oh, this, this person knows security, they, they said firewall once, so they're obviously an expert, right? Um, that's the, the curse of competency. You say one thing one time and, and you ha end up being that person. Even if you're that person, are you going to ostracize yourself from the rest of your team by saying no all the time because you're taking this prestigious role as security? 
Or how can you provide positive value back to your team where placing you in that role will actually increase your chances for promotion, increase your chances for executive visibility, um, have a better end of year review, you know, add positive value to the organization in a way that they want to continue not only employing you, but maybe pay you more, promote you, move you through the pack. Back and forth, I'm telling you, black slides, white slides, that's how it works. I see the eyes every time you gotta adjust. The reflections are bright, I tell you what. So, from a reflection perspective, <clears throat> does your current process in information security allow for developer development flexibility? This doesn't have to be your developers. They can be, like I said, this can be sysadmins. This can be, I love the sunshades. <laughs> I just saw that you did that. Um, that's so funny. Um, that topic's so bright, you gotta wear your shades, right? Um, does the process for tool onboarding or system onboarding or code promotion or upgrades or whatever somebody wants to do that is going to progress the business forward? Hey, we want to work with customers in this new way, so we need this new tool to do X, Y, Z. And you come in for a security review, nope, it doesn't meet our authentication standards, we can't do it, we can't do this, we can't do this. Does that process allow for flexibility? If that new team wants to build a service, is the process long and painful? I work with customers all the time where the process of approval for using a new Azure service or deploying a new application or implementing something new within the organization is longer than it takes for the rest of the work to be done. It's the approval process. I have um, a blog post about Azure Databox and offline data migration. And it talks about, you know, you can get these, you're migrating a whole bunch of data to the cloud, you can get these giant racks of hard drives and systems to uh, offline move all your data and you can do a petabyte per box and it's gonna be great. It'll drastically increase your time to migrating that data. But when you think about the time for security approval, for privacy approval, for Mary and Joe's approval, and then for everybody to feel comfortable with the fact that the UPS driver is taking your data even though it's been encrypted four different times and you have a GPS tracker on it and a sheriff with a shotgun in the back seat, 500 meg over the internet's gonna be faster for your petabyte, <laughs> right? Are you allowing those new processes to happen in a way that's not drawn out and a painful process? Thinking objectively here, if you put yourself in the shoes of one of the individuals that has to come to the security office, bow down and offer you, um, I don't know, a cup of coffee or whatever it is that it takes for, for you to talk to them, um, is the process so challenging or so cumbersome that they just wanna use their own credit card and get it over with? I can't tell you, I was in this position at one point. Um, I ran the entire development environment for one of my teams at another company, it wasn't Microsoft, I promise. Don't tell them I said that. Another team, on a credit card. I got so many credit card points, it was awesome. Um, I spent like eight grand a month uh, on cloud services and it was fantastic. Security never had to know. It wasn't bad, we, were, we got pseudo approval, it's okay. Um, but does the process push you in that direction? And does the current intake process scale? Most organizations are woefully understaffed in security. Now whether that's because we think we need to be doing more or because we're gating processes to go through us and we're becoming that bottleneck, does that scale? And if not, how do we always work towards removing security as a bottleneck? Most organizations, I would say per 1,000 employees, maybe have two security professionals, if that right? Sometimes they don't even have a security professional. So how does that process scale? Can we think about maybe best practice documentation? We, we allow a workload and the reasons why we allow the workload and what we changed and the decision, the decisions architecturally and from a security perspective were documented and we publish those out. Hey, if you want a new communications application. It has to be able to do this, it has to be able to do this, it has to be able to do this, and we have to authenticate in these ways. Take this to your vendor, see what they say, come back to us, and then we'll have that conversation. 
immediate scalability by best practice documentation. Do you have a process that allows for at least visibility into the tools that your organization is using? So once you become that trusted advisor and you change that culture where people want to work with you, how do you go back and address what is essentially technical debt for the things that those people put into production or started using before they wanted to work with you that are still in shadow IT? How do you address those situations? On-prem, we can use things like um, next-gen firewalls with app ID, fingerprinting. Um, for cloud authentication, we have things like CASBs, things like that, so we can run in sort of a, just a detection mode. What are we using? Oh, hey, we're using this tool. That's odd. Um, let's go talk to these people. Hey, I notice you're using XYZ tooling. Love it. Productivity, that's fantastic. Can we work together in a way that you and I both are not putting the company at a higher risk profile? And can we create a plan so that we can work together on this? And phrase it in a way that you are helping them. You are an ally to them. You're allowing for the, their productivity while also allowing them to be in compliance with what the organization needs. Because again, nobody typically wants to be malicious. They just want to get their work done. So some closing thoughts. I went back to the black screen for you. I don't think there's a white screen after this. I, we'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> Be a team member. If cybersecurity is a team sport, are you playing on the team or are you the ref? Be an ally. Work together with those teams so that they want to, in a way that they want to work with you that they're not trying to get around you, doing all this work only to get to a no, to create more work. Provide value. If you get to the point where you stamp that thing, no, say no but, or no and. No, you cannot open up a Radius server on Active Directory to the internet, but let's work together on a site-to-site -site VPN. I think we might need to do this as an organization anyways. Um, let's see what that would look like. Providing value to that process. And lastly, add EQ to the IQ of security. There's an emotional side to people getting their work done and being at work all day and being entrenched in what they can and can't do. If you add the emotional quotient to the intellectual quotient of security, you provide significantly more value and are significantly more approachable by everybody in the organization. That creates a better culture. Thank you very much. I ended a couple minutes early, so Ryan might be running back to the stage now. We'll see what happens. So until that, you know, we got three more minutes. Does anybody have any any thoughts? No? All right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead and unplug, and uh, we'll get set up for the next speaker. Thank you all very much.